Praise the Lord, church. I'd like to welcome everyone back to another online service. I remember sending praise reports, prayer requests, names added to our prayer list at cljcrequests at gmail.com. Uh, please continue to pray and fast for Zach Carter. Uh, this week we'll be wrapping up the quarter. It'll be lesson 13. Uh, it's called We Need the Lord. Focus thought is God will bless those who recognize their need of Him and pursue Him. Focus first is Obadiah 1 and 3. The pride of thine heart hath deceived thee, thou that dwellest in the clefts of the rock, whose habitation is high, that saith in his heart, Who shall bring me down to the ground? And lesson text is Obadiah 1, 1 through 4, and then verses 17 through 21. The vision of Obadiah, thus saith the Lord God concerning Adam, We have heard a rumor from the Lord, and an ambassador is sent among the heathen. Arise ye, and let us rise up against her in battle. Behold, I have made thee small among the heathen. Thou art greatly despised. The pride of thine heart hath deceived thee, thou that dwellest in the clefts of the rock, whose habitation is high, and that saith in his heart, Who shall bring me down to the ground? Though thou exalt thyself as the eagle, and though thou set thy nest among the stars, thence will I bring thee down, saith the Lord. And then 17 through 21. But upon Mount Zion shall be deliverance, and there shall be holiness, and the house of Jacob shall possess their possessions. And the house of Jacob shall be a fire, and the house of Joseph a flame, and the house of Esau for stubble. And they shall kindle in them, and devour them, and there shall not be any remaining of the house of Esau, for the Lord has spoken it. And they of the south shall possess the mount of Esau, and they of the plain of the Philistines, and they shall possess the fields of Ephraim, and the fields of Samaria, and Benjamin shall possess Gilead. And the captil captivity of this host of the children of Israel shall possess that of the Canaanites, even unto Zarephath. And the captivity of Jerusalem with Shepherd, y'all forgive my pronunciations here, shall possess the cities of the south. And Savior shall come up on Mount Zion to judge the Mount of Esau, and the kingdom shall be the Lord's. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for many blessings. Thank you for your love and your kindness. The, the, everything you've done for the church for keeping cancer out, keeping our travelers safe, our soldiers safe, our children safe. We thank you for the word that we receive. We thank you for the opportunity to be, be able to gather back in person again to have search like we used to have it. God, we ask the Lord to bless the service. God, use it for the upbuilding of your kingdom. Let lives be changed. Let hearts be pricked. Let this word go out. Let everyone see that we do need you every second of our, every hour of every day, that we do need you, God, that for everything that we do. We can't do anything without you, God, and let this go out and let someone's life be changed. Let their hearts be pricked. Let someone turn to you. If it's a backslider, someone that's found us on YouTube or Facebook, just let them turn to you and see that we need you, God, and that they need you. And I ask the Lord to bless the church, God, you know, keep everyone united, give the pastor wisdom and knowledge during this time, touch all those that are still suffering from the virus, all those who have lost loved ones, all those that are in the hospitals, God, all the all the nations that are in distress, and bless Israel and all the people, the innocent people, bring peace to that land, God, and bless our nation, bless our leaders, and help them to always do what's holy and acceptable in your eyes, and we give you all the praise and glory for it, Lord, in Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. likes to say, you may be seated. And one of the things I hope we, we all learn today is valuing the things of God. We'll talk about Esau and, and, and what all that he squandered, and he did not recognize the importance of what he was truly given up when he got rid of his birthright. His decision would even go on to affect generation after generation after him. The book opens up with a story of a young teenager, and, and it talks about how she felt something that was that was missing in her life. And she would go to the altar at her church and she would cry and pray and she would seek after the Lord. And week after week, she, she would go do this. And the people in the church came up to her and said, you know, that, that's not really necessary, that you've already accepted Jesus in your heart. You've already accepted Jesus into your life. You really don't need to come to the altar and pray anymore. That's all that you need to do. Pray at the altar once and just accept Jesus into your life and everything else is going to be, you just go out and be a kind person, and everything's going to be good. And to us, that sounds very strange, very contrary to what we do. Why wouldn't you want to be praying at church? Why wouldn't you want to be seeking God at the altar? But for many, that's the extent of their walk with God. They just say, I'm going to accept Jesus, and I'm going to go be 
a good person. The old Stephen Curtis Chapman song says there's more to this life, more than just living and dying, that if we just turn our eyes to Jesus, that we'll find that life truly begins at the cross. You don't just walk after him and, and talk to him and seek after him just one time. It's a constant daily thing. We have to recognize that we need him and that we have to pursue him every day. You walk with him. You know, Calvary wasn't the end of this thing. It was just the beginning, and it opened the door for each and every one of us. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. If you're not pursuing God, if you're not walking with him on a daily basis, then you're really not living. You can have all the money in the world, and you can say that I'm living the good life, but if you ain't got Jesus, then you're not really living. There's only one life that we all should really desire to be after, the one we should desire to have, and that only comes from seeking after God, from realizing that you need the Lord. There are many songs that are sung about it. Um, you can take this whole world, just give me Jesus, I've got Jesus, and that's enough. And it's, it's easy to sing about doing it, but it's another thing to actually live in and to realize it. The girl in the story went a few years living just like everyone else in her church, that she's, I've accepted Jesus and, you know, now my part is complete. It's just or, or waiting out time till, till judgment day. And a few years goes by and she still feels this restless, empty feeling on the inside. And one day a friend invites her to an apostolic church. And it was a, a, a different service than anything she'd experienced before in her home church. And in that service, she says she felt the same tugging to go to the altar to seek after God as she did in her young teenage years. And she began to cry and she began to pray. And then she began to just say the name of Jesus out loud. And at that moment, God filled her with the Holy Ghost. And she began to speak in tongues and, and it kind of confused her for a minute. She would point to her mouth and she didn't understand what exactly was happening to her. And she may not have understood everything that was happening to her, but she knew that she no longer had that empty feeling that she once had, the, that empty feeling that she walked in with. And what was happening to her right now is what she spent so many years searching for. She felt a draw from the Lord and answered it. She sought after God and God rewarded her. If she would have stayed exactly where she was at, if she would have continued to listen to all those people in her church around her and stopped desperately seeking after God, she might not have had that experience that she had at that church one night in that apostolic church and God filling her with the Holy Ghost. But sadly, too many people live their lives just like that. Too many ignore, forget, or simply do not value the things of God. Just like Esau, they don't value it, and then they lose their chance at that inheritance. There are many blessings and, and you know, gifts and everything that are associated with serving God. And I want every single one of them, you know, we sing a song, every promise in the book is mine. And I want everything that's, that's entitled to me. And that's part of the blessings of being a child of the king. But above all those is making it in to heaven. And that's the grand prize of our inheritance. And the only way I receive that reward is realizing that I need Jesus every single day. That I must fall after him every single day. The title of this lesson is, we need the Lord and we truly need him for every aspect of our life. And if we truly value the things of God, then it should be clear to us that we need him. But if we don't really value them or if we take them to, for granted, we're going to end up just how Esau and his descendants ended up. The story of Jacob and Esau is one you, you guys have heard many times, but, you know, like Dwayne says, you know, not everybody knows the Bible as well as some other people. So you got to give a little bit of backstory. And so Abraham's son Isaac and his wife Rebecca have twins. Even in the womb, the two brothers are constantly struggling with one another. In those days, the firstborn received the blessing and the birthright. And their fighting must have been so great that it troubled Rebecca. And it says that she sought after God. And she asked God, what, what is happening? And God says, there's two nations inside of you. There are two manners of people. There are two different distinct people that are inside of you. And one will be stronger than the other. But contrary to the established roles of this day, that the elder is going to serve the younger. And even on the day they were born, the struggles continued outside of the womb with Jacob holding on to Esau's heel, born within mere seconds of each other. But Esau, in that's those few seconds, he still retained the rights of being the firstborn. As they grow old, their different personalities begin to show the, what God had told Rebekah. You know, they're two different men's people. They began to show Esau was a cunning man. 
He, he was a hunter. He was a man of the field. And it says, Jacob was a plain man that liked to dwell inside of the tents. And then one day, the first incident between them happens, the trading of the birthright. If you go to Genesis 25, 29 through 34. And Jacob saw pottage, and Esau came from the field, and he was faint. And Esau said to Jacob, Feed me, I pray thee, with that same red pottage, for I am faint. Therefore was his name called Adam. And Jacob said, Sell me this day thy birthright. And Esau said, Behold, I am to the point to die. What profit shall we, excuse me, what profit shall this birthright do to me? And Jacob said, Swear to me this day, and swear unto him, and he swore unto him, and he sold his birthright unto Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau bread and pottage and lentils, and he did eat and drink, and rose up and went his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. There's a lot to dissect just in these few scriptures in this in this moment. There's the relationship that these brothers must have had. If, if Jared came home one day, you know, he traveled all the way in from New York and, you know, his hunger was kicking in and he said, I'm at the point of death. I would, I would try to get him something to eat. I would not try to scheme or take advantage of him in any way. When we look at Esau, he's a big, hairy man. He's a hunter. He's a man of the field and no doubt he had some strength on him. And so when Jacob rattles off and I picture him, you know, being a little smart when he's saying, you know, just, just sell me your birthright and I'll, I'll give you this thing. I believe Esau probably could have taken Jacob because he was a man that liked to dwell in the tents and Esau was a man of the field. And if he'd really wanted to take that meat, to get that pottage, to get that soup, whatever it was, I believe Esau, if he really wanted to, if he was hungry enough, that he could have done it. Or he could have went elsewhere and because I'm sure Jacob wasn't the only one out of the servants that had food. I'm sure there was tents and everything that had food prepared that he could have went to but he just, that's how little he valued his birthright, that he just thought about uh, a bowl of soup. And this is the first instance we see of Esau not valuing the things of God. And, and siblings know each other very, very well. If you guys have brothers and, and sisters, you know how to press buttons, you know their likes and their dislikes. And, and though it's not mentioned before in, in the scriptures, we can take a pretty educated guess that Esau didn't care much for his birthright. And Jacob knew exactly how Esau truly felt and how easy of a target that he would be. And I'd say he felt pretty confident that day knowing that he could swap a bowl of stew for Esau's birthright. At the end of the scriptures we just read, it said Esau disper despised excuse me, his birthright. Strong's defines that as having contempt, disdain, or simply just not giving any care about it. And often we talk about his birthright, we talk about missing out on the double portions, all the riches, you know, that, that are mentioned, you know, that he's missing out on. But there was something more that he was given up that was more important than any land, than any cattle, or any gold. He was the grandson of Abraham, who God had made a special covenant with. And then, you know, that was carried down to Isaac and would be carried down to his lineage. The line would continue to go on, and no doubt the boys had heard all the stories about Abraham and God and Isaac and God, about how Abraham was called out of Ur, and about how Abraham served God and how God stepped in and provided the sacrifice when Abraham took Isaac to be sacrificed on the mountain. And with that birthright, Esau was supposed to carry on what started with Abraham, but he traded it all away. People still do that today. They'll trade away the things of God for something temporary in this world. Complacency sets in. Things are taken for granted and they lose sight of the value of what God has for us. Just in this church alone over the years, the number of people who have walked out that door to never come back, it, it's an unreal number. I, I try not to think about it because it, it's sad and it's something I can't wrap my head around to walk around from a church where God has blessed us and he's, he's kept us and he's protected us and he's kept cancer out of the church. He's kept all our children dedicated and our travelers safe. You know, blessing upon blessing. You don't have to fundraise. You don't, nobody's guilting you over tithes and offerings. And because I've been to churches where they've taken up a whole lot of those things. They've told people to mortgage houses and things would come back to them. But we don't have to experience any of that stuff here. But some people just walk away. If it was a company that was offering a benefit package like that, you'd have thousands upon thousands of people standing in line applying for that job. But because it's church, people decide to view it differently. It's not as valuable to them as they value things in this world. Knowing full well 
what Jesus did on the cross and what he did for us at Pentecost, people can turn their backs and walk away and it doesn't even bother them one bit. None of us are perfect, you know, and I know we all mess up, but if you can feel God here and you've seen God work here and, and do everything and then just leave and go back out into the world, then you've lost sight of the things of God and you truly don't value the things of God. Demas fought the good fight along with Paul. He suffered many of the same things that Paul did. He endured a lot of things, but when he came down to the end, he ditched Paul. Paul said, he has forsaken me because he loved this present world. He was focused on what's here versus what was coming down the road. Jesus said in John 12 and 25, he that loveth his life shall lose it. And he that hateth his life in this world shall keep it unto life eternal. If you love this present world, if this is all that you seek after, then you've already lost your life. But if you'll focus on what's after this world, if you'll forsake the things of this world and cleave and value the things of God, then you're going to have eternal life. That's our birthright as a child of God. If we stay with him all the way day after day, then we're going to receive our inheritance. Hebrews 12 16 and 17 cuts, uh, uh, does not cut Esau really any slack. And it says, Lest there be any fornicator or profane person as Esau, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. For ye know how at that afterward, when he would have inherited the blessing, he was rejected. For he found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. Don't be a demon. Don't be and Esau, don't trade away the things of God for a temporary fix, for a temporary high, for a temporary pleasure in this world. Man will bend over backwards to try and please the world and to try and please other people. But when it comes to pleasing God, efforts by many people can just be lackluster. The events of Jacob and Esau from their birth to the death of Isaac span a period of 120 years. And the Bible scholars out there can't correct me if I'm wrong. But in the span of that time, not once do we read about Esau caring or seeking after trying to please God. He sold his birthright for some food. When he was 40 years old, he married outsiders. He married Hittites from the land of Canaan. And that, it says that brought grief to the minds of his mother, uh, uh, Rebekah, and Isaac. And after Jacob was about to leave, after deceiving Isaac and receiving the blessing, he told Jacob, he said, don't go out and marry any woman from Cain and go back to our people and go find one. And Esau heard this, and then he decided to go marry another woman. So he went to, the, to grab a daughter of Ishmael to be his wife. He didn't ask, why shouldn't I marry a Canaanite? What, what's wrong with, with mixing with the Canaanites? All it says is that he did it to please his dad. Esau was a man that was focused on earthly things. He didn't care if it was not anything God wanted to do. He was just figuring, wanted to please people in this world and to please himself in this world. And because of Esau's actions, his descendants, the Edomites, would suffer for years to come, many years of being uh, subject to, you know, being the subjects of the descendants of Jacob. David killing 18,000 of them before bringing them finally back into subjection. Living under the rule, they rebelled, and at the end of the kingdom, they joined forces against Judah. And no matter what battle they fought or, or victories they may have had, the children of Esau were never going to supplant. They were never going to eclipse the children of Jacob. Unlike Esau, Jacob saw the need for following the Lord in, in Genesis 28. 12 through 22, there's a few scriptures here. And he dreamed, and behold, a ladder set up on the earth, and the top of it reached to heaven. And behold, the angels of God ascending and descending on it. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham, thy father, and the God of Isaac, the land where thou, whereon thou liest, to thee will I give it, and to thy seed. And thy seed shall be as the dust of the earth, and thou shalt spread abroad to the west and to the east, to the north and to the south. And in thee and in thy seed shall all the families of the earth be blessed. And behold, I am with thee and will keep thee in all places whither thou goest, and will bring thee again into this land, for I will not leave thee until I have done that which I have spoken to thee of. And Jacob awaked out of his sleep, and he said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I knew it not. And he was afraid and said, How dreadful is this place? This is none other but the house of God, and this is the gate 
of heaven. And Jacob rose up early in the morning, and he took the stone that he, that he had put for his pillows and set it up for a pillar and poured oil upon the top of it. And he called the name of that place Bethel, but the name of that city was called Luz at first. And Jacob vowed a vow, saying, If God will be with me and will keep me in this way that I go and will give me bread to eat and raiment to put on, so that I come again to my father's house in peace, then shall the Lord be my God. And this stone which I have set for a pillar shall be God's house, and of all that shall excuse me, and of all that thou shalt give me, I will surely give the tenth unto thee. Jacob was scared for his life. Esau and him had left on, on pretty bad terms. But then God speaks to him and he gives him the same promise that he gave Abraham. And Isaac, and then he promises to be with him. Wherever you go, I'm going to be right there with you. That he would bring Jacob back into the land, back towards his father's house in peace. That he would be with him all the way until God did everything that he had spoken of. And aren't you glad that you always have a God that's with you wherever that you want to go? If you're one of his children, he's always there with you. And he just wants us to serve him. He just wants us to do his work. And if we do those things, if we serve him and do his business, then he will be with us wherever we go and he'll never leave us. Everyone loves quoting, you know, the, the scripture, I've never seen the righteous forsaken. And I always tell people there's only one issue with that scripture and that you actually have to be living a righteous life to be covered by that. There's so many promises in the Bible and everyone has a chance at them. But not everyone gets those promises because not everyone's willing to live the life that it takes to receive those promises. If we want what's in the book, then we have to first recognize that you need God and that you need to constantly serve him. Right. Jacob said, if the Lord keeps me and, and does what he says that he would do, then he's going to be my God. Nobody else but the Lord shall be my God. And, and one thing you can always count on is when God says he's going to do something, he's going to do it. And the Edomites, just like Esau, had a problem in their heart. They suffered from the sin of pride. Jesus mentions pride as one of the evils that comes out of man's heart. And the Bible says pride goeth before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Another thing that pride does is that it, gets, it, it causes us to lose sight of God and the things of God. And pride causes us to focus on ourselves instead of God. Or we try to take credit for things that God has done for us. The first thing mentioned in Proverbs on the list of abominations and the things that God hates is a proud look. Nebuchadnezzar forgot who he had exactly been dealing with. And as he strolls through the palace, he said, is not this great Babylon? Is this not which I have built by the majesty and my power and the honor of my majesty? In an instant, and it says, as those words came out of the king's mouth, there came a voice from heaven and in an instant, God transformed him. And he was changed back. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, you know, he was basically as a wild man. It said that he ate grass. That it was like he had feathers that come upon him. And he was only changed back into his normal form when it says that he lifted his eyes up towards heaven. And at the end of his blessing, he said, And those that walk in pride, he is able to abase. You may think highly of yourself. But God can lower the boom on you, and he can bring you down real quick. And Nebuchadnezzar learned that lesson firsthand, that it wasn't anything that he had done, but it was what God had done for him. In the first scriptures of Obadiah, we see the, the pride gene has continued to carry on for generations. From Esau, God said, I made you small among the heathen nations, and thou art greatly despised. The pride in your heart has deceived you. It's caused you to believe that you are something that you're not. He said, you dwell in the clefts of the rocks. You, you're set up in the highest part of the country, and you look down upon everyone else. You dwell at a high altitude, and that's pretty much affected and inflated your ego. You say, who shall bring me down from this height? Who is going to bring me down? Though, it says, though thou exalt thyself as the eagle, and though thou set thy nest among the stars, thence will I bring thee down, saith the Lord. You can set yourself as high as you want to, but God says, I'm going to bring you right back down. And Adam was about to learn the exact same lesson that Nebuchadnezzar had learned, that God is able to abase, to bring low any proud person. And Malachi, the Edomites, say that, that they're going to return and to build the desolate places back up again. And God says, they shall build, 
but I will throw down. He said, you can do all that you want to, but I'm going to tear it right back down. In Deuteronomy, God tells them, uh, he's talking to the Hebrews, the Israelites, and says, do not abhor or detest the Edomites, for he is thy brother. But now judgment is being passed down. Pride has blinded them and has kept them from valuing the things of God. They started with the grandson of Abraham. He had wanted, uh, Esau had wanted revenge on Jacob. And after some time had passed, he had a little bit of change in his life. And he still ended up receiving a blessing from Isaac. And when Jacob returned back uh, to see Esau again, it says that Esau ran upon him and grabbed him and hugged him and kissed his neck. And Jacob tried giving him gift after gift, but Esau began to refuse these things. He said, brother, I have enough. You know, they were talking to Esau himself was rich. And the Bible later says that he and Jacob had to be separated in the land because they had so much riches, they had so much stuff that the land could not bear both of them together. Now, if only the Edomites of the future would have kept that peace with the children of Jacob, they learned a lesson from Esau at that moment. But instead, they still had a chip on their shoulders. Last week's lesson, Brother Tom was talking about, you know, people not wanting to let stuff go. You know, if they had just let things go from the past, things could have been a whole lot different. But no, they were still upset that they were having to serve the children of Jacob. And eventually their pride and anger became so great that they sided against their own family members. They rejoiced when Jerusalem fell. They even got in on the plundering and the destruction of the city. The book says that to the Edomites, this may have seemed like the poetic justice, the things they've been waiting centuries for, that they, they had deserved. They had finally taken over the children of Jacob. They had gotten the birthright that they had, you know, had been stolen from them. But God has a different plan than what the Edomites had, and judgment will be poured out upon them. Obadiah 1, 10 through 16 says, For thy violence against thy brother Jacob, shame shall cover thee, and thou shalt be cut off forever. In the day that thou stoodest on the other side, and the day that the strangers carried away a, a captive his forces, and foreigners entered into his gates and cast lots upon Jerusalem, even thou was as one of them. But thou shouldest not have looked on the day of thy brother in the day that he became a stranger. Neither, neither shouldest thou have rejoiced over the children of Judah in the day of their destruction. Neither shouldest thou have spoken proudly in the day of the stress. Thou shouldest not have entered into the gate of my people in the day of their calamity. Yea, thou shouldest not have looked on their affliction in the day of their calamity, nor have laid hands on their substance in the day of their calamity. Neither shouldest thou have stood in the crossway to cut off those of his that did escape, and neither shouldest thou have delivered up those of his that did remain in the day of distress. For the day of the Lord is near upon all the heathen, as thou hast done. It shall be done unto thee, thy reward shall return upon thine own head. For as, as ye have drunk upon my holy mountain, so shall all the heathen drink continually. Yea, they shall drink, and they shall swallow down, and they shall be as though they had not been. They got what they wanted for years. They had the destruction of Judah. They even helped in the process. But just like Esau, they too only focus on the short term. They didn't care about the long term. They got it. They got that temporary fix, that temporary good feeling that they wanted, that desire, that earthly fix that they needed. And it caused them to miss out on something a whole lot greater. If instead, in the past, in the book of Numbers, if they had let the Israelites pass through their land, things may have turned out different for them. Instead of casting lots with the Babylonians, they stood side by side with Judah in those final days. Then maybe they might be spared this judgment. But because they didn't, it says they will be like they never even existed, that no children of Esau will be left. And the Lord said, I have spoken it, and that's what I'm going to do. And Obadiah, it ends on a high note. And even though things were bad for the children of Esau, it lets us know that God will always restore his people, the ones that seek after him. It says, on Mount Zion there will be deliverance, and Jacob will take back his possessions. What the enemy had taken from the children of Jacob was going to be restored unto them. 
all the possessions, all the cities. And not only that, it says holiness would return unto Jacob. And like, the, uh, like how the book says, so we often equate holiness with a list of rights or wrongs or how we should dress or we, we shouldn't dress. We just slap it on a few different things. But holiness is a whole lot more than that. It encompasses our whole lives. And holiness is, how, is us living our lives how God wants us to live, being holy because he is holy. That's one of the common commandments you'll find in the Old Testament is God wants us to be just like him, that God wants us to strive to be like him. And that first step towards holiness, towards restoration, towards deliverance, whatever, anything that you can need, it comes from us recognizing that we need him and that we should be pursuing him. The Bible says God is a rewarder of those that diligently seek after him. God is not stingy. He is, uh, he's not a Scrooge when it comes to giving anything. He is freely. He's just free one and handing it out. But the people who are always receiving the blessings that he's pouring it out upon are the ones that are constantly seeking after him, his children. Jesus told us, and I'm closing right here, Jesus told us how the, the birds and the lilies are taken care of. It says he clothes the grass and says our Heavenly Father knows every need that we have before we even ask. And then he says, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Seek after God, and the rest is going to fall. Every piece that you need in your life is going to fall right into place. But first, you have to seek after God. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, God, we praise you, God. We love you, Lord. We thank you, God. God, we thank you for this day. We thank you that we have the opportunity to serve you, that we have the, the chance to seek after you, God, and help us to seek after you, God, that we realize that we need to seek after you, not just you know, on a weekly basis on Sundays, but every single day we need to be in contact. We need to be in prayer and fast, and we need to be striving to be holy like you are. That You command us, be holy, for I am holy. And God, help us to be holy like you are. And God, we thank you for the blessings that you've given us in this church, the, the opportunity to be here, the opportunity to come back in person again for keeping cancer out, uh, for keeping our soldiers safe, our travelers safe, our children safe, just everything that you've done for us. God, you constantly pour out blessing upon blessing upon God. We're not worthy of it, but we thank you that you continue to look down upon us and that you do. You are mindful of us, God. And we thank you for what you've done. And help again, help this message go out. Let someone see it, God. Let their lives be changed. Let their hearts be pricked. Let them see that they do need you on a, in every aspect of their life. If someone, as we talk about in the sorry of the church, they see this, God, let them turn around. Let them see, God, remind them of what happened. Remind them of what church used to be and that they do need you on a daily basis. And again, we ask you, God, to bless all those that have lost loved ones to this virus, all those that are suffering with it, all those that are on the front lines with it, God. And again, just bring peace to our nation, bring peace to the other nations, give our leaders wisdom and knowledge and understanding, and help them do what's holy and acceptable in your eyes. God, we give you all the praise and glory for it, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <laughs> Church, I love you. Hope everyone has a good week. I look forward to seeing you on Sunday.